Hello all. Okay, we're, re we're ready for Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, I'll get right to it. Enjoy. First of all, let's just do a quick review of what we've gone through in Ephesians so far. It begins with chapter 1 um, is how Jesus made known to us the, his, the mysteries of God and how powerful he is. Then in chapter 2 is how you are saved from the condemnation of uh, the world who has rejected God. And how um, when you connect yourself to Jesus, you're connecting yourself to this family, this family of God. And and how you're, the, the Jews are, are a part of that family also. And it, uh, it used to be only Jews, or only Israel. Now it is anyone from any nation. In chapter 3 he talks about uh, how what was once hidden is now revealed and the boldness and access and confidence we have in Christ to approach God and how we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we are a part of this family. And then in chapter 4, he says, because of all that, that you ought to walk in a certain way and, and hold certain standards um, because you are a part of this family. Okay? Uh, grow and you grow up in this family into being like Christ. So now we're going to hit chapter 5. He says, Be you therefore followers of God as dear children. So as the children of God. And walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So that um, is a reflection back to the covenant under Moses where um, they would appease God by sacrificing something of value to themselves. So uh, Christ has sacrificed himself or his life as a value on our behalf. And he's saying, okay, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. So these are the, uh, don't do these uh, things that will bring shame upon the name of Christ is, is what he's saying. You have to uh, live up to your responsibility as a part of this family. Uh, fornication, that um, some people will say it's sex outside of marriage. It's actually, uh, the, the, the Greek word is porno. It's, it's uh, illicit sex. Uh, sex without any commitment, um, that kind of thing, and uh, all uncleanness. So all the uh, things that are considered uh, not right to do, and covet covetousness is uh, desiring what other people have, comparing yourself to other people, um, and fornication also includes idolatry. 
the worshipping of idols. God has never liked idols and he never will like idols. Um, a true believer in God and a true follower of God has no use for any objects to connect himself to God. Uh, the connection is already there. It's, it's an unseen spiritual connection. It has nothing to do with objects. Objects um, get in the way of that connection. Um, uncleanness can also be a, a blasphemy. It, it's a, a uncleanness of doctrine, uncleanness of teaching. Um, you have to follow the pure teaching that is in the Bible and in related books to the Bible that, that um, uphold the same kind of standards. And covetousness is comparing yourselves to even other religions. Um, we don't need to compare ourselves to any of those things. So act like saints is what he's saying. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient. So uh, joking around, um, talking foolish, uh, you have to um, be wise with your words. It doesn't mean that jokes are evil. It's um, just don't don't um, overly overly do those kinds of things. <clears throat> Giving of thanks is it's a having a, a thankful heart for all that you have and depending and relying on God to provide those things for you. For this you know that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So whoremonger that's um, like a womanizer or, or uh, a, a person who just collects women okay unclean person is um, a person who um, is outside of the standards set by God. Covetous man, a man who's always looking at what other people have, always keeping up with the Joneses. Idolater, that connects to fornication. See, all these things he's saying are connected to uncleanness, unclean person, whoremonger, fornication, idolater, fornication, it all connects to the things in verse 3, right? None of these things are in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. So there's going to be people coming along deceiving you and telling you things that just aren't true. For because of these things, these things that he's talking about, because of these things, the wrath of God is upon the children of disobedience. Now, there's a whole um, study and, and understanding of what all these things entail, and each one. And there's, there's a, an old covenant uh, teaching, and there's a new covenant teaching of what these things mean. Um, basically, <clears throat> what Jesus said is that what it amounts to is love others 
as you would love yourself or do unto others as you would have them do to you and so if you keep to that standard then you will pretty much cover all these things and um, you, you, each one of these things is a study of its own really to understand what it all entails and what it all means but it's basically having a moral standard And, and nowadays, you know, they talk about, here, here's a perfect example of vain teachings. As they talk about, oh, uh, you know, a right to abortion. Uh, because if a woman becomes pregnant, then she has a right to not have her life ruined by having this baby to drag around and pay for. She has a right to have an abortion and get a career. Well, first of all, the, the baby's right is completely ignored, to the right to life. And second of all, is the, the getting pregnant in the first place. Um, is there any responsibility entailed for doing that in the first place? And um, the, the, the problem or the slippery slope here is that it puts life as something um, that is of little value. A new life is of little value compared to uh, this this person wanting to get rich or wanting to have a a, a life of you know easy money and and uh, and no responsibilities <laughs> so you know it's it's kind of, it is kind of a vain teaching and there are others too about um you know the teaching children to change their sexual orientation um now in today's society i would say adults have uh, a right under our society to uh decide if they want to um, be effeminate or if a woman wants to be masculine and dress a certain way they have a right to do that but when you start uh, bringing in the into the education institutions of education and confusing children into having life-changing surgery then that is uh, um, way beyond the bounds of individual rights that that is a, a damage to society as a whole so it's another uh, vain teaching a deception that they, they they bring it off as some kind of a moral superiority when the morality is left the building already so you know, you have to have some kind of a ground for what is and what is not moral in the first place before you start talking about uh, imposing moral authority on others. You have to have some kind of a moral understanding yourself. So, as a Christian, these things are dictated by the Bible. Now if you want to be something else, well that's something else. Okay, be not partakers with them. Uh, don't get carried away by these other things that are not biblical. For you at one time were in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. So walk as children of light. That sort of speaks for itself. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So who defines goodness 
and righteousness and truth. God does. And in the, if you're a Christian, those things are defined by God in the Bible and, and taught and understood through the acting of the Holy Spirit which is within you that will show you these things and why these things are truth and why they are good and why they are righteous. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord because it's not just a matter of God getting what he wants it's a matter of God telling us what works and what doesn't work and what is wholesome and what is harmful um, that is what is acceptable to God he doesn't just pick things for no reason he does these things for our good And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Right? Stand against it, criticize it, um, you know, and, and also stay within the laws of the land. Everybody has a right, and we also have a right. We have a right to speak up too, and we can stand for what we believe in and unfruitful works of darkness. We're starting to see a lot of this manifested. What's been going on for centuries is uh, unjust war. How about that one? Uh, a lot of war is just an industry now. It's an industry to waste the guns and bullets so that they can sell more bullets. You know, it's unfruitful works of darkness the things that are done in secret where we bring things to light and we try to do what is best for everybody in the light there's no reason to lie about things for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret well, we're starting to see now some things being manifested to us uh, regarding uh, worldwide human trafficking networks. I can imagine there's uh, some things that are even shameful to talk about in those places. But in all things that are reproved and made manifest by the light, so things that are told to be wrong are brought to light, showed openly by the light, for all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. So if you talk about these, um, it's like Mel Gibson is saying, uh, the first step to dealing with the problem is awareness. So things that are reproved, that have been said to be wrong to do, those things are made manifest by the light. The light is reproving them. And whatever, whatsoever does make manifest is light. So anything that brings truth into the open is light, is from God. Therefore, he says, Awake you that sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. So when you rise up and stand for what is right, you will get more light. It will come to you. It will help you. And where does he say this? Awake thou that sleeps. 
Um, there is no real verse that I've been able to find that says this exactly. Um, but this is um, a general understanding in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament. Um, I'll demonstrate this in uh, the book of Isaiah. This understanding kind of stretches out over several chapters. You see in Isaiah chapter 52, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For from now on there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bands of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. So this is uh, prophesying about the coming of Jesus. So now over the next few chapters, we can look at Chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. Right? So, let your light shine before men, you are the light. This is part of the gospel message. And the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes and see, they all gather themselves together, they come to you. You see? So this is uh, a part of the gospel, coming to bringing the light. And if we look in chapter 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, Jesus said this in the, in the synagogue. He read this chapter. But it also applies to every follower of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Vengeance is against those who are, who are imprisoning those who mourn, imprisoning the captives, uh, oppressing those that mourn, you see. Um, the victims, the real victims, the actual victims. So um, this is sort of the general understanding that I'm talking about. That Paul, um, you know, when he talks about the scripture and what the scripture says, oftentimes <clears throat> he will paraphrase. Uh, several chapters into one sentence. So I think that's a case of this is a, this is the case in this time. So now that we're back in Ephesians, therefore he says, "Awake, you that sleep, and arise from the dead." The dead. Christ talked about people walking around as the dead, the one non-believers. He described them as the dead. He said, let the, let the dead bury their dead. When a man said, I'll come and follow you as soon as I bury my father, he said, let the dead bury their dead. And, and so he sees the, those who awake from death as being born again um, are the ones who come to his light. So arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Oftentimes these concepts are, it's not only talking about one thing. It's like 
It's like giving life to something that applies to everything. See then that you walk circumspectly. So walk according to this teaching, according to the light. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. So we are li living in an evil time when, when all of these moral standards are being deconstructed before our eyes. And um, you have to become wise and not be a fool and uh, bide your time and, and, and take your opportunities to help others to find the truth that you have found and do what you can for the kingdom of God because that is your family. Therefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So what is the Lord's will? The Lord's will is that none will perish and that all will come to the light. That's the Lord's will. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit. So don't be drunk with wine all the time and excessively uh, drinking alcohol because I guess you can't be both. You can't be filled with the Spirit and full of alcohol. Um, the Spirit is sober. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So the psalms are very powerful. If you read the psalms, you'll find that um, it's very peace, brings a lot of inner peace. And it's a very good way of connecting with God is just reading the psalms. Um, the rest of the Bible is very good also, but the Psalms are poetic and most most of the time they're glorifying God. So there's an awful lot of uh, spiritual rejuvenation to be had from the Psalms. Giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. So everything we have, our life and everything in it, comes from God in the name of Jesus Christ. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Okay? So this is talking now about the community right and um, treat others as children of God also and I know um, you know we all have times when we have not done this and I also have times when I have not done this or maybe you can't do it anymore for somebody um, but it's a good standard to adhere to. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. Now, a lot of people have problems with this verse. Um, but this is... Uh, if you are comparing the family unit on earth, 
seen more from an ancient perspective, not on not necessarily a modern perspective. And you compare that as being a reflection of the relationship between God and his people. So wives submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. He is the protector and the provider, just like the husband is to the family, right? Therefore, as the church is the subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. And um, so there's a responsibility there, and it's teaching the children um, authority and teaching the uh, unity of purpose on the whole family is that the husband, as the one out in the world, gain, getting the food and getting the materials and protecting the house, or the household, the fam he's protecting the family on, from the outside. Um, the, the mother and the wife is more a part of the inside of the camp. The husband is protecting the outside of the camp. So that's what this is talking about. And then the husband also has responsibilities. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So even if you have to give your life to protect this family, then you do it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, so that Jesus might sanctify, that is to make it holy, and to clean uh, the church with the washing of water by the word. So, so Christ is uh, patient that his family will, will eventually come to the light in a more full way. that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So he's cleansing his family. He's cleansing the church and making them holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Because the wife is a, a part of that family. That, that um, the children are a part of her as they are a part of him. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord does to the church. So there's the, the parity between God and the church and the man and his family. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. So here's talking about Jesus Christ, because we know Jesus is God in the flesh, and he rose to heaven in the flesh. Uh, we are members, we are of the same flesh and bones. For this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father 
and be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So this is a great mystery. So where does this come from? This comes from Genesis chapter 1, or chapter 2. So it's right here, Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now the bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and, she, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So this is uh, the... Um, the birthing this um, this uh, propagation of the species of man so Adam was very happy to find this woman who is a complement to him and then when they have ch children then that man that they have will leave them and cleave to his own wife and they shall propagate the species. So we're back in Ephesians now. For this cause, for what cause? For we are members of his body and his flesh and his bones. Uh, that Jesus sees those who come to the light as a part of his own body, like his own children, okay? And for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Um, it is a great mystery. Like, how does that work when you think about Jesus and the church? This is what, this is a great mystery. Um, was Jesus going to leave the Father and join the church and be with the church and be a different family? Like, the, is that how that works or is there some other way to look at it? This is the mystery. So it's uh, this is a great mystery when you think of it concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And see, and, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So, think of your, what he's getting to, basically, is think of your relationships in your family with your wife and your children, or with your husband and your children, as, um, as like that relationship that Christ has with the church. And... Um, even if we don't understand the mystery of how that all ends with Christ, and we don't understand how it all ends with us either, but I guess what we do understand is that it propagates our species, that when we are gone, we left behind other families who will leave behind other families. And that um, we also leave behind these teachings and the light of Christ in, in our children and in others. So, um, you know, to, to think of this type of relationship in a healthy environment is the man loving the wife as his own flesh and as himself 
and the wife reverencing him as the protector and the provider, that is a healthy relationship if it is done properly. Now, people will point out problems that happen in a relationship that makes it a not a healthy relationship where this situation starts to become something that doesn't work. And so they point it out as something that doesn't work in the first place. When actually it does work in the first place. It becomes a problem if, you know, if the husband is a drunkard or a wife beater or if the wife is, you know, messing around when he's at work. Uh, of course you're going to start to have problems. But when this is working together as a healthy relationship, this is the ideal situation for children to grow up in. So there is something to be said for this, this relationship working in this way. And that is a, a biblical understanding of it. And just with uh, almost anything, any topic, the biblical understanding is quite pure and something we don't often live up to. Uh, but it ought to be the standard. So that's it for this week. We will see you next week. Shalom. Have a good week. In modern times, the society is more focused on the right of the individual. Whether you're a man, a woman, or a child, the government and the courts would um, treat you as an individual. And then from there, the, the responsibilities of parenthood or guardianship and things like that are built upon that, that the, the individual child has certain rights, not, you know, not to be abused and uh, things like that and a uh, right to an education and a right to uh, a nurturing environment, I guess you would say. And um, for this reason, they can take a child out of a family put it into a institutionalized environment or into a different family. And um, every individual is, grows into society as a contributing member of the whole. And uh, every individual has certain rights. And the family is kind of second to that. So when we read the Bible, we must understand that um, it was different in those times than it is now. And if you really read the Bible, you will find that uh, we are in dysfunctional times, um, not functional times. That some things like the individual rights and freedoms are actually... Um, birthed from, partly from, the New Testament also. But in the New Testament, those individual rights don't trump family responsibilities. But in modern society, they, they, they do in certain cases. So, um, like family responsibilities are not law in today's society. It's only contracts. So, um, you know, I'm no family lawyer, but it, you can understand it's a different system than, than in the old days. So when, when we read Paul, we want to think about uh, from the society in his time and in times before that. 
which was pretty similar. And the way things would work, the way the family was, was for certain reasons. That the, uh, the, the, the family itself was more like a camp. And that camp would move with the, 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 with the seasons. They would go north or they would go south, depending if there was drought. And they would, uh, if they were sheep herders or cattle herders, they would stay in a certain area for a season until perhaps the, the, the greenery got low. And then they would move to another place. And they would pick up their tents and their camp, and they would move. And they would um, set up camp in another place for a while that would keep their cattle. And uh, the land rights were rights that were understood by the people in the area where they lived. And in the areas that they traveled to, they had made deals with people. And those deals were considered uh, hereditary deals that would be passed down to the son. The, whatever deals the father made, the son would continue to benefit from and to take care of those deals. And... Um, the family unit was more of a camp where the children were, would, mo for the most part, stay in the camp. And the women, for the most part, would take care of the camp. While the men would be more out uh, foraging, out hunting, or in some cases out fighting. And... And their, their main responsibility would be to protect the camp and to find uh, resources for the camp. And the women's responsibility was more internal in responsibilities within the camp of uh, the feeding and the cleaning or the the day-to-day the, uh, -day maintenance of, of the family and the people in it. Um, so when we think about it from that perspective, the man or the men, the, the old elder man or the father of the, of the camp, um, he would have the ultimate responsibility. And the sons would often take a wife and then start their own camp. And, um, you know, the, the grandmother uh, would be, uh, the man and his wife would basically be the, the patriarchs of the camp. So um, the women also had rights. They, they had, uh, they would be the one that would, um, Perhaps if the man wasn't providing, they had a right to demand that he provide. And they had rights to, uh, a right to have a child, a right to be fed and be cared for. So those were uh, the responsibilities of the man. And the, along with those responsibilities comes rights that enables you to carry out those responsibilities. So those things were much more laid out in, in ancient times than they are today uh, for, for the roles played by uh, different sexes and different ages. So <clears throat> when we read Paul, we have to understand what those roles were at that time and not try to judge it from a modern world perspective. So, uh, you know, when Paul says, the man takes care of his wife as God takes care of the church. Well, what is the church? The church is 
the woman with all the people. So what is it? How is the wife like a church? Well, she's the woman with all the kids, you see. And how is the man like God? Well, he's the one providing. He's the one bringing in the beef and uh, protecting the camp. So th these are how um, God and his people are likened to the family unit. And because God is the creator, then the family is like a reflection of the relationship between God and his people. And that reflection goes down to the man and his family. And along with that comes responsibilities. And this is what Paul is um, alluding to. Those responsibilities and those relationships. And how in a Christian system these relationships are maintained. Now, in uh, modern times, being up to the individual, um, a Christian family may, may maintain a relationship in that nature that is described by Paul, or they may have uh, a modification of that. Living in the modern world, you know, we don't exactly have uh, cattle fields and uh, hunting grounds and things like that. But you still have a home, and you still have to protect the family, and the kids still have to be cared for. So sometimes the woman has the job, and the man stays home. So it's actually a reversal from the traditional role, uh, but people will just adjust to those situations, and, and as long as everybody understands their place and and their role in the situation and uh, keeps their responsibilities and there shouldn't be any problem with that um, but in understanding Paul um, I think his main point is that there there be a mutual respect for each other that was the main point of it now, thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. Uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much.